All right, I think these babies are ready to go. This is Rib Fest. It's been a family tradition every summer for as long as I can remember. And now we get to experience one of the few moments where the Popola family becomes fairly quiet. <laughs> We're a big Italian family. We love our food. And then, oh yes, and there's the bacon. There's the bacon. I never really questioned how we eat or where our food comes from until I met my wife, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> You're horrified by all of it. <laughs> Lisa comes from a big Italian family, too, but she stopped eating meat a long time ago out of concern for the animals and has challenged me to take a closer look at the choices I make. So while I'm no animal activist, I am a filmmaker, and the best way for me to honestly explore this issue is to hit the road and make a film about it. Since I've never had the chance to really interact with a farm animal, Lisa thought we should kick off our journey at Animal Place, one of the oldest and largest farm sanctuaries. Oh, oh my gosh, this is huge. <sighs> Wilbur's only been with us for, gosh, less than three months. And he's just one of the most gentle animals we have here. And he is trusting of people. He's gentle with people. He's friendly. And I'm happy to see that he's going to be living out his last few remaining year or two in the lap of luxury. <laughs> It was one time, it was a reporter years ago, was asking me, well, what do you want folks to leave with, you know, when they visit the sanctuary? Um, what's the one message? And it's, it's easy. It's just, it's respect for all life. That's it. I am always forthright with what our belief is and what our goal is, and that is to end animal exploitation, to end the use of farmed animals. You say farmed animals? I do. I use the term farmed I, to emphasize the fact that these are, these are individuals that we are actually farming like crops, like corn, like wheat. There is this powerful disconnect we have of animals that we eat. I think part of that is because most people don't have the opportunity to get to know a cow or a chicken or a pig, and therefore they really don't see them as living, thinking beings. What about you? They're very human looking eyes. We tend to have empathy for those individuals, those species of animals that we have relationships with, like our dog or cat. But those animals that we don't have any relationship with, except for what's on our plate, it's a real powerful disconnect. Hey, Wilbur. 
<laughs> I wanted a facility where folks could see firsthand the instruments um, and the cages that are used on farming. This is the human gestation crate. Oh, uh, you get this one, okay. John. Yeah, you get step in here. And I think we're actually gonna latch you in. Okay. I'm gonna give you a little bit of wiggle room. And you can kind of kneel down a little bit, not very comfortably. Maybe not. if you go to the side, can you turn to the side a little bit? No. Nope. Or maybe that's even a little bit more cramped than the pig. I'm gonna give Only you a little <laughs> bit more. I'm gonna give you a little bit more room. So this is the price that they pay Here, for me to eat that my. Much uh, for me to eat my uh, spare ribs. Yeah, yeah. You know, solitary confinement and absolutely no ability to move. Right, and they can't even do this, right? I mean, they're, they're just. Yeah, they're like that. They're just like this. So. And they end up chewing on the bars. You're right. I mean, it's right here, right behind you, there's the stereotypic behavior that we see. Oh, yeah. yeah this is your life. This is it. This is it. And, and think about why you have a life like this. You know, to satisfy someone's palate. That's it. Because I taste good. Because it tastes good. A gestation crate is a production system where a sow is housed in a small crate while they're pregnant and typically it doesn't allow the sow to turn around. These pigs are gonna live most of their lives indoors, sometimes on concrete floors, sometimes on slatted floors. You can house many more sows, you can have more babies. So it's a system that will produce more pork than a system that doesn't have those gestation crates. So a farmer faces an incentive to adopt that system to be able to compete in the marketplace, but at the same time, it's a system that may not take into account the well-being of, of that individual sow that she may want to turn around, for example. Well, I think this, the industry's gonna have to phase out to station crates. Every survey has shown two-thirds of consumers consider that a degree of restraint that's just not acceptable, it just has to be phased out. Be like living in an airline seat, and I'm never allowed to walk in the aisle. I can just imagine what my joints would feel like. The way pigs are raised on modern farms has become a major controversy. But what do actual farmers with experience using these systems think about it? To find out, we visited a farm in Indiana that raises over 80,000 pigs per year and has opened their doors to the public. Our job here is to try to control and systematize the conditions of life for 2,400 animals in this particular barn. The gestation stall on this farm is used for the insemination process. And six to seven days uh, post weaning, then we will move that sow to the pen. Virtually all breeding on pig farms is done artificially. We use a robot to lead the boar around. Pheromones are released through the saliva, through the mouth of the boar. We put him in front of the sow, she smells it, and then that simulates her sexually. I think it's good to go back with a historical perspective and think about how we ended up with uh, even having gestation stalls. Weather conditions, disease conditions, predator conditions, all made it very difficult to have them outdoors especially if you had more than a few pigs. I think that an animal can have a rewarding and sustained life in a stall, but I, I don't know how to, to convince somebody that's never seen that before that that's okay. Am I willing to throw this under the bus? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not. Am I gonna change? Probably am, because my customers saying I, I need to. Legacy Farms is testing a new system designed to replace long-term gestation crate confinement with open pens, allowing the sows to move freely and socialize. In the industry, the lingo is electronic sow feeding station. 
This gives individual attention without uh, having to put them in individual stalls. From a husbandry standpoint, it allows us to walk with the animals, to, to be with them, but it comes with a cost. I will happily figure out a way to raise pigs however the consumer wants to have them, as long as the consumer is going to pay me for the expenses that I have to put into it. Oh, he's not screaming. No, so you just hold him again like a, like a baby. That's a little boy. Wow, look at him. They're so warm. Yeah. Our highest calling is the stewardship and care of the pigs. Uh, we understand that there's one bad day, but in that, in that lifespan of that pig, it's our calling to take away the stressors, to give the proper food, to monitor the proper nutrition, to help them be bred, and to help them have their baby pigs. You had reacted against the notion of anthropomorphizing the animal. How do you think of what these animals experience? Why did you react that way? We can get ourselves worked into a tizzy and walk down a path that really is incorrect if we, if we buy into this whole thing that uh, those animals have a, a mind, they have a voice, do they have a soul? Putting human characteristics into an animal is not the right thing to do. Man does have dominion over the animals. Man does have a calling to be a steward of the animals. God did give those animals to us as a means of support, as a means of supply, and that that relationship praises God when we do that well. Many pig farms aren't as big or high tech as legacy farms, though I can see how competition puts pressure on small farmers to either go big or get out of the business. So we headed to Iowa, the largest pork producing state in the country, to meet up with the president of the Pork Producers Association, someone who knows the pressures of the market firsthand. Let's go. The economists at Iowa State University have, they run numbers and um, they're looking at, based upon the futures market, both for the cost of the feed inputs as well as the prices for hogs, we only look at about a $7 a head profit average on the year. So $7 uh, per pig is not a lot. Um, it pays your bills, gets you a little extra, but it doesn't allow you to uh, buy a whole new flooring for a building or you know do a major remodel. This building was one of the earlier confinement buildings built in Iowa. It was built in 1969. It's been in continuous use for exception of maybe a two month period since 1969. And uh, there's always been a farrowing. Always been a farrowing house. Had multiple styles of flooring and stalls. And a little boy. Hi. Hi. Can I hold him? You can, you just gotta take, you're taking the risk of getting defecated on, you know. Oh boy, okay. You, you could, you know, you're washable, Hi. right? Oh, he's shivering. Hi. What we're gonna do next is a standard practice. I call it processing litters because it's a multitude of things. What it's doing is giving an iron injection to the piglets because iron is the only major nutrient missing in mother's milk. So that helps with any, uh, and prevent any anemia and any iron deficiency. We're also going to what they call dock the tail, which is clipping the tail to a shorter length. There's a lot of things in life that aren't pretty, 
but they're done necessarily, and they're not wrong. And I guess my personal belief is that you show somebody what you do, you let them observe it, they can make up their own mind and not be stuck with a preconceived idea that someone is fed into them. When these pigs are around 30 days old, they're weaned. They come in here at roughly a month of age, and then they'll stay in here and grow in here until their uh, market weight, which is about five to six months after. Turn to the light. A shock prod is used very sparingly. Come on, Chubby. with us around, or was that pretty typical? Uh, that's pretty typical. Actually, that's better than it is sometimes. Uh, they just, they're very obstinate. They are happy where they're at, and they don't want to leave. And they go to come over to the door, and a lot of times they'll push and shove. And you can't get angry. And that's been a struggle for me over the years, but I've gotten much better at it and containing it. I don't get angry. We used to be the largest producer in the county, and uh, we used to market about 17,500 a year, 17 to 18,000 a year. But uh, when you go through a stretch of time where you lose money on every single animal you sell, and all you're selling for money is, is a pig, because you're feeding all your grain, you got nothing else to sell but pigs, and you lose money on every pig, it just gets worse with volume. I got tired of taking on more debt and decided, okay, we won't have any more employees. We won't artificially inseminate. We won't uh, have to use all the facilities pushed so hard. We'll just go back and let boars do the breeding and kind of go a little more old fashioned and not have to work so hard. I think a lot of times when we talk about industrial agriculture, we have this vision of these kind of fat, evil industrialists sort of standing over the world and like operating marionettes, sort of making industrial agriculture happen. When in fact, it, it was a result of hundreds of thousands of small decisions made by small farmers over time to do the most natural thing that a farmer can do, and that's to produce more with less technology was there, the knowledge was there, the resources were there to do this, who wouldn't do it? So why have farmers gotten bigger? Why are there more corporations in farming? And it's because you and I as food consumers want to pay lower prices. We put the pressure on the marketplace to get bigger, to adopt the latest technologies, to innovate, and a lot of times that innovation is going to happen by big companies involved in food and agriculture. But by and large, the individual farmers have options, they have choices. And so I see a lot of independent-minded farmers out there that are not beholden to corporate interests. thing in the whole world. This farm raises pigs in an outside system. And when I say outside system, I mean the animals are either on a pasture with growing grass or they're in a barn with a very big outside space so they can really spend a serious amount of time outside every day. 
you can see it's full of trees and old-fashioned buildings, and it just doesn't fit in with the factory vision of farming. It's a process that starts with the land. So I decided to think about organic farming because that's the closest thing to embodying our philosophies. My farm is largely the way it is because of my aesthetic sense and my ethics and my sense of how food ought to be. The pig manages its own temperature in the wild by wallowing in mud and being in shade. When it's cold, the pig in the wild manages its temperature by building a nest. So since we know these natural behaviors, we can replicate them on my farm. So you said you castrate your pigs. Why? So it's, it's, fair, it's fair to say that since we're talking about animal welfare and my farm purports to have animal welfare at a, at a, at a high degree or higher than standard, that <clears throat> we can be scrutinized over any practices here. So we castrate only, not because we like it, it's because we think that it helps the, the food quality in the end and it, it stops half of our pig population from turning into sexually mature boars. We'll just watch those sows. They, they probably won't get too angry, but just in case they get angry, you need to run. So we're first gonna just take out the sow and she'll just walk out here and come out the door and then be outside, be out in the pasture away from us and we're sort of safe from her in case she gets a little bit angry. It seems like it's really an invasive mutilation, um, and it, it is, I guess. Don't be so mad, Sal. Come on, come on, come on. Don't be so mad. I'm a businessman who profits from selling pork. I'll state that. That's, I live by that. But I do this for a reason. So this runs to my core. It runs to my, my, my innermost philosophies on, on farming and food and the earth and, and man's place and animals' places. And so I'm, I'm expressing those things in the form of a business. And detractors of this system say, that's the problem. It doesn't work on a big scale. You can't make a lot of animals like this. Therefore, forget it. It's just a novelty. I think she, she might be coming too, but she's not as good as this one is. Okay. This is the, the, the semen. Yep. We have one in the heat already. We bred one time yesterday, but we're going to do that again today. She's just standing here, and we know that she's in, she's in an intense, what we just call standing heat. And people say, well, you can't do this without crates, but it simply just takes an interaction with the animals to find out who is, who is in heat, like we did. And then the, they won't let me stand on their back. So that means they're not in heat, so there's no reason to try to breed them. So to me, it's, it's just uh, intuitively simple to do this. 
In the United States, our food system is really driven by companies who are out to make a profit. And those companies will respond to consumers' choices. They have to. No matter what company it is, no matter how bad you think they might be, they will respond to consumer spending habits. So the consumer has to vote with his dollar because that's what drives this whole thing beyond, to, to take it beyond a novelty for the intelligentsia. If you get down on the ground, then you seem less intimidating, and they'll come over to you and they'll get closer and... Oh my gosh, look at this one. I wish I could, I wish you could really like know what's going through their heads right now. Because there's something more complicated going on. <laughs> she really likes you, Lisa. She does. <laughs> like, I know you had ham for lunch, you jerk. Terry Branstad is the longest serving governor in U.S. history and an influential voice in the world of animal agriculture. Echo. Piggies. So I got a chance to talk to him about the direction of the industry. I actually raised pigs, but I can tell you what happens when you have rainy days like this. The pigs get sick. We just want the public to know the truth about uh, uh, all of the good things that have been done to improve uh, agricultural operations and protect uh, a safe food supply. In fact, recently, a Chinese company purchased Smithfield Foods because the Chinese want a safe, reliable supply of pork, and we produce that here in Iowa. Interestingly enough, Xi Jinping, who's now the president of China, his first visit to America, he came here to Iowa and was in this office. That's a gift from him. And so is this uh, yellow uh, vase here. So um, truly, it's not, it's not a bad deal to have the president of the biggest country in the world call you an old friend. There are definitely strong political and economic forces driving farmers towards large-scale monocultural confinement operations. But there are farmers bucking this trend with an approach that integrates the land and multiple species in one system. We raise five red meat species and pasture raise five poultry species and slaughter them here on the farm. I went to the University of Georgia, majored in animal science, came home and ran the farm as a monocultural cattle operation as my father had run it. I gave that up. I was in the business of raising cattle for the lowest possible cost. And if you had told me that my animal welfare was really not as good as it should be, I'd have taken you outside and whipped you. But it wasn't. So we used to push animals where we wanted them to go with horses and dogs and cowboys. The cowboy culture is glamorous. It's probably the most glamorous form of agriculture. A certain kind of uh, male of my generation is kind of enamored with that. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing for the animal or the best thing for the land. You know, I never would have really considered dominion and stewardship and, and what is right and what is wrong. A lot of my opinions have changed with regard to that. I thought good animal welfare meant I didn't intentionally inflict pain and suffering on the animal. Well, that was never true. We just came to think of it that way. Good animal welfare to a stockman means that it's incumbent upon us to create an environment 
in which the animal can express its instinctive behavior. So this is about a 40-acre forest, and it's really a good place for hogs. These hogs get nothing to eat except eggs from our pasture laying operation and peanuts and what they forage out there in the woods. We don't have any sort of gestation stalls or farrowing crates. You can see that these older hogs, bigger hogs, have got their ears notched. We don't do that. We don't do any cutting of any sort on an animal. But we had to get in the business, and we had to buy some existing livestock to get in the business. This is the way hogs evolved over how long? Millions of years? This rain's getting my hogs wet. Word in the street is you can't get them wet. They get sick. Not been my experience. So which part of the way you used to run the farm bothered you the most? I would have mama cows would have calves on these pastures. We'd raise them till they were eight months old. They'd weigh about 500 pounds. Uh, we load uh, 95, 100 of them on a semi, double deck semi. They've never been off the grass before. We put them on that truck with the ones above urinating and defecating on the ones on the bottom. And they'd be on it for 30 hours without food or water or rest. It's a very traumatic experience. You know, they don't understand this. You know, this is the end of the world for them. So we really took a plunge and built a USDA inspected on farm slaughter plant. You know, there's some places that have a small slaughter plant on the property, they just walk the cattle over. Yeah, that, that's a big advantage because you don't have to stress transport and expense of transport. For decades, Dr. Temple Grandin has been designing slaughterhouses in an effort to reduce the stress that animals experience in their last moments. The kind of things that I've worked on in the slaughter plant, a lot of real simple stuff. First thing I have to do is get people to stop yelling and screaming at animals. First step that anybody has to do to learn better stockmanship is to calm down. Training people to bring a small number of animals up at a time moving a light to make a reflection go away. Cattle are afraid of a reflection on the floor, a coat on a fence that's too dark, especially in a high novelty noise environment like a slaughter plant. It should just look into a lighted space, into a wall, into a blank lighted wall. It seems like a deep contradiction to care about the emotional well-being of animals while raising them for food, which is why so many farmers truly struggle with it. In the heart of Nebraska is an organic pasture-based rancher who's become an unlikely animal advocate. I get shot at from the extremes on both sides. You know, the militant vegan abolitionists hate me because of what I do out here. The factory farmers and the industrial farming sector hates me because I speak out against a lot of their practices. So I represent the reasonable middle ground, and I think that's where these battles are won and lost. With animals, you're talking about living, sentient beings that have feelings, they have emotions. That's been proven. I think it's our moral obligation to care about those animals. This whole idea of, well, yeah, we have dominion over the animals, that's fine, but dominion does not mean complete domination.
tell me where we're headed, what you're going to show me. We're going to be heading to a massive cattle feeding operation south of Broken Bow. It's one of the largest beef feedlots in the world. Approximately 100,000 head of cattle there over several square miles. In an industrial model, the calf would be born on a cow-calf operation somewhere. At some point, it would be weaned from its mower and trucked to a, a feedlot. And then they're fed a very high carbohydrate diet as compared to our animals that eat forage all their lives. Oh, this guy's not going to let us do anything. Well, that's all right. It's OK. Hey. How's it going? Good. Hey, my name is John. Troy. Troy. So we're, we're making a movie about uh, farming. And I've never seen one of these before like this. Well, if you have questions, you know, we try, we don't want the videos and everything just for biosecurity purposes and people stopping. If you've got questions or if you need anything, I give you a number for a communication department. You can okay. contact them. How many? So you, this is like 100,000 cattle just in this area from here yeah. to here? Yeah. Wow. And then there's all that over there? Yeah. On a hot day, they'll lose dozens of cattle a day just from the heat some of these feedlots on a really, really hot day, they can lose hundreds. I get asked all the time about what are the biggest welfare issues with cattle. It used to be handling. Now it's mud and heat stress. Those are your two main things you need to be concerned about in a feed yard. And you need to have enough shade so that all the animals can lay down in the shadow. When it rains here, it gets really muddy and mucky, and it's not so bad on a dry day, but it gets dusty. And... Those guns are to spray water. And, because that ground out there will be as much as 30 degrees warmer when those cattle are standing there and laying on that ground than it would be on my pasture mm -hmm. if you lay down on a green grass. But this is almost like laying on concrete at times. Why, call Why would you need to call the sheriff? Because I've asked you nicely. But we're not doing anything that's illegal. We're, we're standing here uh, filming. We're on so, you look, know, public right away. Yes. We're not on your private property. I, I couldn't call myself a farmer. I couldn't call myself a steward of, of livestock or land and own an uh, operation like this at all. They experience dust. They experience mud, their own fecal matter. It troubles me to see this. But you know, it's the way, the, it's the way our beef is produced. John will forget about this when it comes time for dinner. It's real easy to judge me because I'm not this, like, instant. I don't have this instant reaction, please. Like, I, you know, you, I, I process things in my own way. You know, this is, I ha, when I see this stuff, my first reaction is just to take it all in. I don't have, you're very different than me. But you're an extremely empathetic person. I know that about you. These At situations, least for humans, you are. These situations like defy empathy. They're they're so abstract. It's a hundred thousand cows, and then they're weird because the cows don't. They're walking around. They're just. It's not a. I don't know. I, that's not walking. That's stumbling around in your own poop. That's that's not living. Now anybody can take pictures of things. And one mistake that ag has made is ag gag laws, making that against the law. That is not the thing to do. You need to fix practices. Under pressure from the animal agriculture industry, several states now have laws making it a crime to record unauthorized videos on farm properties. Ag gag stands for agricultural gag order. Critics say these laws chill free speech and aim to silence whistleblowers. Actually, Iowa passed the law. It's worked very effectively. I think I signed it a couple of years ago. The only thing it says, if you lie to go on somebody's property to try to defame them, there's a, there's a penalty for that. 
and that penalty can involve being put on a domestic terrorism watch list. Why the hell would we want to make the whistleblower the criminal? It implies that we have something to hide, and we do have a lot to hide, in my opinion. When they seem paranoid about something like ag-gag, the fear goes much deeper than just somebody taking pictures of their farm. The fear is that we'll actually develop a fuller understanding of what has to happen to animals biologically in order to give us the stuff that we're told over and over again is, is good for us. When any consumer would walk into a supermarket to buy something more healthy for their family, and you look over here and you see this nice red barn and this fence and this white chicken and it's humanely raised, it says who? Craig Watts is a contract chicken grower for one of the largest commercial brands in the country and has been an outspoken critic of what he sees as misleading industry advertising. So why did you speak out? Uh, I just felt like the consumer was being lied to. A lot of the seed and the labeling, the marketing, um, serious issues with animal welfare, which they're selling that they are, you know, the kinder, gentler, integrator when nothing has changed. All right, we can put on booties, too? Yeah, we gotta put on booties. All right. <laughs> so now what's causing my, my eyes to burn? There's a, um, you have horrendous ammonia, uh, so there's a chemical to treat the ammonia. So the solution to a chemical is another chemical. That's what you're feeling. With broiler chickens, the biggest problem has been the accelerated growth of these animals, that we have turned them into these enormously fast-growing animals where they have chronic pain and suffering as part of their developmental process. We can't sustain raising billions of chickens a year in barns that contain tens of thousands of chickens at a time who have pumped up breasts, who can't stand on their legs because their breasts are so heavy, because we've come to like soft, cottony white meat. Craig grows nearly half a million chickens per year in his four barns, so he's seen it all, from genetic deformities to chemical burns from birds laying in litter. The advances in breeding techniques and the understanding of genetics leads to animals that were radical deformities of what they once were in their natural state. And so by the middle of the century, you have Cornish crosses, which is a breed of chicken that can reach slaughter weight in six weeks. Now, traditionally, chickens could live up to 15 years. The whole process is like 38 days from, from start to finish. You're really gonna have to start at about two weeks really zoning in on culling. What's culling? Well, that's when you, you kill a bird that's not going to make it. This, well, you, in this business, it's about homogenizing that bird size for that plant. If you've got, if you want this, a chicken this big, and I've got like half of my chickens are like this big, but there's nothing wrong with them. They're accessing the feed, they're accessing the water. They're, that's a cull. There's no deformities, there's no issues, no disease problems. So there again, there, that's under the guise of welfare. In many ways, the foundation of factory farming goes down to the ability to breed animals that have a certain genetic uniformity. It allows for a kind of assembly line approach to production when the animals are objectified to the point where they're almost no different from each other. When I first started, and coming here and seeing this, every time I would close my eyes, I'd see it, like when I try to go to sleep. OK, so you have to crush or their dislocate neck. their heads if sure. they're not doing so well. Is that hard for you? Uh, mentally? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're killing a live animal. It's just, uh, no, that's no fun. Um, and physically, it's not hard, but uh, you know, see, the deal is, every one of these chicks, I have a cost. 
So basically that little chicken there is 30 cent. Well, that doesn't sound like much to you start carrying out 1,000, 1,200, 1,500. I had 3,500 in this flock over here. So you know, you're getting over $1,000. So it's a financial hit. And then you got the hit of, Jesus, you know, I'm out here having, my job is to kill chickens. Pick up dead chickens and kill chickens. Craig, leave your brain at home. You will not be needing that today. We need your back and your uh, expertise in uh, properly euthanizing. So. Right. The thing you learn is when you call, this is the set the method. You point it this way and you lean a little bit. So you don't get it. And, and if you get it on your hand, you've done it exactly right. <laughs> Jumping jack flash. They say that didn't hurt them, but how the hell I know, you know? Eyedropper? Sugar in the water. A little bit of sugar in the water. And that should. Wait, wait so you're gonna keep the bird? I want to try to bring him back to life and then bring him back tomorrow. Remember how strong you told me your marriage was going up here? This is the test. It's classic, Lisa. <laughs> but you've taken it to that next level. Oh, he's so sad. Look at his eyes. I know. His eyes have dark circles around him. Do you want any more? Yeah, see? He still wants more. He's like, I'm being saved so that... Eight weeks from now, I can be sent to a slaughterhouse and turned into chicken wings. Come on, John. What matters to this chick? <laughs> Plus, I think I found a lady who's going to adopt him. So what's it going to take for big change to happen <clears throat> in poultry. A lot more farmers doing what I did. I'm talking about just open your doors. You bring the local editor from your newspaper. Don't say a word. Let them decide, let them put it in the paper, and let the public decide. Craig's chickens are marketed as all natural and cage-free but I wouldn't have envisioned these barns when hearing terms like that. Unfortunately, there is bogus stuff out there. There's welfare washing. If I was looking for welfare, I would be looking for a third-party certification. I would find out what their standards are. What is it, to get this rating, what do they have to do? Part of raising their consciousness means we have to be better informed, and that means we have to be willing to do a little bit more work. This is the thing that's so hard, is that you go into the grocery store, and even if you want to do something, you're just bombarded with all these logos. So you're gonna help us figure out which eggs to buy. Okay, be my pleasure. All right. I was a consumer, I am a consumer. I had kids, I have grandkids, I shop. I know how I felt, and I think I'm just typical. I just thought that a certification and labeling program would work. That's why I did this, to help farm animals, to help farmers, and to help consumers. This just says grass-fed beef. That doesn't mean it's grass-fed beef. All right, let's see what else they got. So rather than reading all this label stuff, I really, if I want to have any confidence, I have to look for the label. For labels. What an animal welfare auditing program allows you to do is trace and look at exactly how that animal was treated. There's a standard. That farm either passed or failed. If that, that label is on there, that animal was treated in the way that the standard said it was. The most prevalent food certification that addresses animal welfare is USDA Organic. Although I discovered that its welfare standards are pretty bare bones. I appreciate what a consumer goes through. It's very confusing. First of all, there's a million choices. You can get a headache. The programs that I know of that are reliable, based on my experience, are the Certified Humane Program, Animal Welfare Approved, and the GAP Program. The Global Animal Partnership is a really unique, multi-tiered system. What we try to do is provide consumers with a transparent way to make informed buying choices. So if you're looking at a step one label, it'll say no crates, no cages, no crowding. Step two is an indoor operation with enhancements. Uh, step three is an indoor system with outdoor access, seasonally. 
When you get to step four, that is a pasture-based system. So the animals have to have daily outdoor access. When you move to step five, you know, we're really looking at providing the best animal welfare possible. For the first time ever, higher degrees of animal welfare are being rewarded in the marketplace, and that's creating incentives for people to innovate and create this race to the top. So how does a welfare-certified chicken farm compare to conventional operations? GAP board member Leah Garces invited us to join her on one of her routine visits. As far as I know, Crystal Lake is, by volume, the largest higher welfare chicken farm in the country. And the bird is like a robust, normal bird. exceeding my expectations. They're Can really ranging, yeah, adventuring. Yeah, yeah, let's go check that out. I gotta see them exploring this creek. I have, I mean, you see pigs in the mud. <laughs> but why not chickens? Like, why wouldn't they want to be cooler and cool off? They just seem like... pretty happy. If you want to have birds that are willing and able to go outside and forage in the grass, then you can't take one of the mainstream stream type chickens, they don't want to go out there. You got to have something that is actually mobile and it's not in pain when it's moving. So we've designed a selection program that deals with that because they like the fresh air, they like to play in the grass and sunbathe. So they're being real chickens. Chickens came from jungle fowl. So why would they like to be packed in less than one square foot per bird. I was just looking at them and just enjoying them, and I thought, oh, this is like their final hours. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. I mean, they're some good final hours, but this is their last day. So we're here to see uh, Crystal Lake chickens be cleared out of the house. They're on their way to slaughter. So we'll see catchers with red lights, uh, red headlamps, and they should try to be doing it in a pretty calm way. Um, we'll see. We'll see what we see. in here and it feels like the stuff of nightmares seeing men with red lights on their heads taking birds off to their death. However, I know like factually taking away the emotion, factually this is this is a, is a very good system. Darkness is really important for keeping them calm. Uh, so it's a less stressful process for them. This is a system where if you're gonna do it, this is the way to do it. It still doesn't feel good, does it? I mean...
One of the problems in dairy is I think some dairymen have a difficult time getting out of the mindset of just producing milk. A lot of people think big is bad. What's bad is badly managed is bad. Size has nothing to do with it. Now, there's some very good progressive dairymen that do an excellent job. The most important thing in dairy farming is nutrition. Between nutrition and cow comfort, you're going to solve 90% plus of any type of health issue with animals. Why don't you have them on pasture? What's the pros and cons of that? When animals are on pasture and they're out eating all the time, grasses are growing at different rates. You don't have the same control to make sure that they're exactly at that nutritional value that you would like to have them at. While if you're growing a crop, you can deliver to that animal a product that is dialed in perfect for her to be very healthy and to be very productive. The feed that she's eating is better than if you could throw her out on a pasture. The beds that she's laying on are better, again, than if she was kind of walking outside, because if it's rainy, she's going to be laying in mud. Well, these girls are laying in cool, comfortable sand, you know, 365 days a year. It's maximizing the resources that we have to get the highest level of production while always keeping that cow extremely healthy, that's first, and then maximizing her genetic potential and getting the maximum production we can out of her. We have to have an abundance of food for this world, but affordable, it's very important. The animals need to be well cared for in order to be productive, but their farmers face trade-offs especially when they're getting signals from the marketplace. And often the signal they get is you, you need to provide a lower price. Again and again, we encountered this trade-off between providing the animals with the most natural environment possible versus the productivity of the farm. Tell me about their behavior and how you, how you sort of handle them. Well, Jerseys are the friendliest breed, actually, the tamest breed. They enjoy their work. They're, and they're healthy because they're in their natural environment. Let's go. Let's go. On average, nationally, a dairy cow, when it comes into a herd, it lasts about 30 months, about two and a half years before it goes off to McDonald's or whatever. That's because they're in confinement, whereas cows on grass don't produce as much milk, but they live a lot longer. John, I want you to get something right here. This is the oldest cow in the herd. She's 13 years old, and she just had a calf here a few days ago. So that's the youngest calf in the herd. But she's look, looking pretty good for a 13-year-old cow. They'd make her like a well-advanced senior citizen if she were a person. I know a number of well-educated adults who are unaware that cows Female cows must be repeatedly and almost always artificially impregnated in order to produce milk. That milk um, you know, is naturally intended for that animal's offspring. In dairy, we separate the mother and the calf very quickly after birth. The mother licks her, dries her, the calf stands, and then we remove the calf at that time. Those animals are under our care, and they have a purpose, and that purpose is to produce food. But it's also our purpose to make sure that they never suffer unnecessarily and uh, that they live a very comfortable life. If you leave it with the mother a day or two days, that's where that bond really starts getting strong. <coughs> Cows 
cows are very social and the mother and the calf are separated. If you allow them to bond, the calling goes on and on and on and the vocalization, the calling out, the crying for each other. The solution that the industry have decided is they have to, they have to be separated right away, even at higher welfare. They have to be separated right away because the bond becomes so painful for them. But what I think that speaks to is the depth of emotion that cows can feel. I don't know if it's just like a flaw in me, but I have these very emotional moments, but they are very of the moment. Like I can go for a while and be, and like hold these experiences in my head and then they fade. <laughs> they fade, they fade into, the, into the distance. <laughs> they don't for you. It's like, I don't know why they do for me. I don't know why you can't hold on to the compassion and have that empathy in your heart as you're sitting down to eat. I guess the hunger takes over. I don't know. I don't know why. Industrialization and the use of technology in agriculture has brought the cost of food down dramatically. But nowhere are the efficiency gains or the impacts on animal welfare more evident than in the production of eggs. In a conventional cage system for producing eggs, You'll have about four or five hens that are enclosed in a cage, and each hen in that cage has an area of space of about equal to a sheet of paper. They'll be housed in a barn, typically with a large number of other hens, and they'll be stacked on top of each other. All the feeding and watering is automated, so there's not much labor involved. Moreover, it doesn't require much land because you have a large number of chickens in a very small space. This is the most efficient way to create a product that is the least expensive for the average consumer. So when you run down to the gas station and you pick up your $1.99 eggs, these are the ones you're going to be getting. Conventional battery cages are arguably the worst of all of the production systems because there's a great duration of the suffering because they're in these cages for 12 to 18 months and because they're so severely confined. In a standard battery cage, the chicken cannot walk at full posture and do their normal little head bob like this. They do not have a secluded place to lay their eggs. No perching, and they like to scratch. Those are natural behaviors that they can't do in a regular battery cage. There's a common phrase that gets bantied around in agriculture a lot, and the phrase is, uh, we need to feed the world. On the one hand, I think it's a truthful statement, but unfortunately, I think it's also a phrase that, that gets used to sometimes justify practices or, or methods that, you know, quite frankly, may be unjustifiable. You know, one thing about big operations, it's efficient. Now, another concern about large operations is fragile. Big is fragile. It's very, very efficient, but it's fragile. There is an alert tonight about a growing outbreak of bird flu rippling through the U.S. poultry industry. A duck shot by a hunter in Washington state has tested positive for H5N1 bird flu, a relative of the virus that's killed 400 people globally. The highly contagious avian flu has now spread to 16 states. The USDA calling it the biggest outbreak ever. The disease spread through the droppings of migrating birds can be fatal within 48 hours. All the time I've been governor, and we've never had this kind of a, uh, a devastating disaster of this magnitude. I was the leading egg producing state, and, and our loss there is over 30 million birds. Almost a billion, not million, billion dollars worth of chickens were lost, a very big percentage of the egg supply. Our family lost three and a half million birds. And it's kind of like one of those grade B movies you see. Wake up three in the morning and I'm watching this 
movie that you know is not true because everything on the screen's dying. And you wake up and you realize you're the cast. They say it's two mutations away from people. It has to go to hogs, and then once it jumps from hogs, it can jump to people. Marcus Rust is the third largest egg producer in the country, and the bird flu is leading him to abandon the confinement of battery cages for smaller, cage-free systems. This is the non-cage system, but we just doubled the room up and give them all this extra space. I mean, this is an enormous difference than the battery cage systems. It's really a battery cage system. There used to be door panels here, and, and we just took them off and never installed them. So would you say that large-scale systems are more vulnerable? For this disease, it is absolutely true. If you put one million, two million, five million chickens on that farm and you get this disease hits, they're all dead. It's made us look at it from a standpoint of, we won't build farms as big as what we build them in the past. The bird flu is spreading rapidly and destroying many farms, um, one after another back east. We're doing as much biosecurity as we possibly can to keep it away from here. Um, it's horrible. I can't even explain it to you how it's ravaging farms. What do you think that's going to mean for the business? Is it going to make an impact? Uh, it's, yeah, it's going to, the supply will get tighter and um, prices will go up. Huge impact. Pasture-based egg farms largely avoided contamination by the 2015 bird flu epidemic, despite worries that the disease can be spread through the droppings of migratory birds. Okay, go slow. Sweet. You dialed in, buddy. This farm has been in the family since early 1900s. It used to be a dairy ranch. Switched over, we switched it to a sheep ranch, and now we're a chicken ranch for the last 10 years. Here, hold these for me. We changed in the chickens out of luck, hearing about the proposition, too. It passed. It created a lot of awareness on the production of animals. In 2008, we decided to do a ballot initiative to stop extreme confinement of animals on factory farms in California. That ballot initiative at that time got more votes than any citizen initiative in American history. And it was really kind of a remarkable statement that concern about farm animals had arrived in our culture. Our birds are organic pasture raised in mobile units. We're able to move the units around the pasture to fully utilize the whole land that we have. We'll add some things that we think that make it better and more efficient and so we can survive the big guys, you know, because we're selling an egg on the shelf for $9.49 a dozen, and they're selling an egg on the shelf for $2.39 a dozen. Any of the egg production systems that get away from the conventional cage are, are going to be expensive. Number one, because of higher labor costs. Another major cost factor, especially for pasture-raised poultry production, is just the land cost. You need more land uh, for the animals, and you also have to make sure that you have enough calories for those animals to eat. I've been in hyper-growth mode for like eight years now with these chickens, and it's not stopping. I'll quadruple my hens this year. To lower the cost of pasture-based production, how can farmers increase productivity while preserving the quality of life for the chickens? Most pasture operations are very low-tech and labor-intensive. But across the country in Kentucky, Egg Innovations is reimagining industrialization in the production of eggs. I'm bringing scale to pasture. 
for the very reasons on the cage side, they brought mega scale because I'm trying to drive costs out of the system. I came from a world of cages are good. I went to a land grant university who reinforced cages were good. As I progressed through and saw what cage free could be, that really begged the further question of what's the next incremental step? And what's the next incremental step? Every time we took another step in animal welfare, we added perches. We gave the birds outside access. In the outside access, we gave them shade. Every time we took another step, what we found was our health went up, our productivity went up, our feed conversions improved. All these things that they said shouldn't happen were happening. When you let them engage in native behavior, the egg is just a natural byproduct of this process. If I had problems with the birds, I couldn't walk up to a bird and just pick it up. I mean, if you weren't doing animal welfare. Can I pick up a bird? Yeah. Just grab it by both legs. Yeah. <laughs> OK. You want to take your hand, you want to put one leg in between your pinky and your finger and the other one here, and then you hold it like that. And birds actually, they don't like to be petted, they like to be underneath their neck. Like I said, if you walked into a cage facility, you couldn't do this type of interaction. When I was 25 years old, I was dominantly in the cage world. It was just a very arm's length relationship. You're there, I'm here, I'm collecting eggs. You happen to be the biological machine that's laying the egg. Once I saw what the bird's behavior was when they had an opportunity to, to interact with their peers and socialize, they simply seemed to have a better quality of life. As a young entrepreneur, there was a belief that this could be good business. And growing up on a family farm, I, I always felt that we had a moral and ethical obligation to take care of the birds. And what was neat for me was to see how those two actually could merge into more of, you know, this is about sustainability, it's about conscious capitalism, and that really began the journey of myself on where animal welfare took me. We have to produce a lot of food to feed nine billion people. There's no way that we're gonna do that without corporations and without industrial scale. Because if you actually kind of sit down and think about the problems that we're concerned with, um, you get beyond this ideological hang up on scale and scope and you actually think about the environmental problems and the ethical problems and even the economic injustices. It's not the size of the farm or the industrialized nature of the farm that matters, it's what that farm is producing. I don't know too many people who would get terribly angry at a large-scale carrot farm. We can better feed the world by eating more plant-based foods and by rearing animals more humanely and sustainably. We cannot afford to feed the world by having these confined animal feeding operations and these industrial factory farms. You don't have to look too hard to find meat alternatives in grocery stores or restaurants these days, even in the heart of cattle country. What can I get for you? So, tell me about this Jack, Jack barbecue? The famous Jack barbecue sandwich. We are known for the Jack barbecue. It's actually made from jackfruit, which is the largest tree fruit in the world. It weighs up to 80 pounds, so it's like it's really huge. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's very meaty. It looked like a pulled pork sandwich on the Is picture. it gonna freak me out if I haven't eaten meat Sometimes in a long time? Sometimes people get freaked out by it, but yeah. most of the time it's so tasty that that overcomes the freaking out. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh, this is good. What do you say, John? Could All this right, convert you? Score one for the vegans with this restaurant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If every meat alternative was actually this meaty and good, it'd be really easy to not eat meat. Yeah, what's the point? 
It's still not as easy as saying, all right, I'm gonna eat more plants. My solution to this was to say, what can I do to change the way that I eat? So I set out to create a set of rules for myself that I was going to eat a very strict plant-based diet from the time I woke up until six o'clock at night. And then at six o'clock at night, all bets are off, I could do whatever the hell I wanted to do. And I did, and I do. I can appreciate somebody who may be a vegan or a vegetarian. I can completely appreciate why they have that belief system and why they choose not to eat meat. Members of this team here at the farm, I think that they consciously think about what's gonna be happening with the animals that they are delivering. So this is our uh, market beef that we harvest out of weekly. There's about 140 in here and I'm gonna take 15 off. So I'm actually gonna start back this way a little bit and I'm gonna kind of work them from the side. When you were out with our animals, you could get pretty close to them. A lot of them would actually come up to you because they trust us and there's a relationship that we have built over time with our animals. But if we were ever to hoot and holler and get them going, then we just broke that relationship or that trust. It is a predator-prey relationship. It's playing out all the time. A predator always has their eyes on the front of their face, and they're always looking forward at the target. So that's why when you walk into a field, the cattle definitely look at you and pay attention. Cows are, are definitely emotional creatures. You know, they respond to our physical body, whether or not we're moving towards, away from them, whether or not we're moving in an angle or we're curving around them. You know, the handling of the animals up until this point is really critical, and that's also being reflected here. You know, breeding cows uh, through their gestation and then raising the calves. Um, you know, of course, there's this whole thing with what we do is we, we spend every day caring for these animals, trying to give them the best life, and then it culminates in us taking it. This is a cohort of cattle that we've known since birth and what their challenges have been and really what the individual animals are. Each successive group exists together from birth through harvest. 2279 steer orange. We work to make all corral working and all working in general quiet like this. 11.30. 11.30. They're herbivores. Everything is about something's trying to kill me. And so that's part of what we're looking to do is to try to have this experience without setting off them. Because what's fight or flight? That's something's trying to kill you. The harvesting, even that term, the harvesting of animals, um, you know, killing. Let's just like put it out there, all right? You know, that's, that's what we're doing. We are killing them to eat them. And how ironic when you just built this bond with them over the course of their lives. With cattle, it's two and a half, three years with each animal. I have often in, uh, you know, darker moments wondered if I'm, you know, am I racking up like a really, some serious karmic debt? When you are raising an animal and it does have a personality and then ultimately you take its life, um, as I get older personally, that is getting harder and harder for me to do. This is serious business. The animals we brought in today are dying today 
for our benefit, our nutritional benefit, our financial benefit, it's more than solemn. It's, it's really serious. I have moments where I just, you know, my, my stomach hurts a little bit. It's usually if I have eye contact with one of the animals before slaughter. It's just really difficult. That's all, that's all there is to it.
say goodbye to him. Uh, the auction's tonight. Uh, he'll he'll be here till Sunday, but when he goes, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to let him go. I mean, people assume since we have pigs, we're big meat eaters, big bacon, anything pig. But I don't like it. Just thinking about like that's an animal that had no idea what was going on to them. Maybe had a relationship with a human. I look at it, I look at the meat and be like, that wasn't a living animal. And it's kind of hard because when we take them on the trailer, it kind of like makes me tear up because they go to this place where people are going to hurt them and they're not used to that because we don't do that to them. Now 5,500, 5,500, great youth, great hog. Great state of Wisconsin, $5,500. 5800 what do you think? We appreciate it. Congratulations, young man. Good to see you. They just told us how they're going to be loaded, and we can't be there with them when they get loaded. The last good meal. I started this journey as someone who chose to ignore what's involved in raising animals for the food I eat. But after spending these months with farmers and the animals they raise, for the first time I truly feel the weight of the decisions I make at every meal. The experience has changed me. It's opened my eyes and my heart to these forgotten animals. They deserve our consideration because their lives are in our hands. So the question we face is this, when the choices we make impact the lives of innocent animals, how should we choose? If you actually take a close look at what it takes in order to bring animal products to our plate, there is going to be unnecessary and often quite egregious suffering that takes place. We can turn away from it, but if we want to be ethical consumers, if we want to eat ethically, I think we have to face it and ask if there are alternatives. Does this mean that we have to completely eliminate animals from our diet? Well, many make that decision. Caring about animals, caring about where your food comes from, caring about how your food is produced is just part of a larger shift in all of civilization to increase freedom, increase compassion, increase quality of life and the tapestry of, of, of the planet as one system. I don't have to cause the death of somebody else to survive. Not only that, I can drive to the grocery store and my goodness gracious, there's a ton of food available to me which is delicious and healthy. Moving from industrial commodities agriculture into an agriculture that's very high in animal welfare, environmental sustainability and fairness is very, very difficult. We'll continue to work through it for the rest of my lifetime and my children will work through it through their lifetime. I get asked all the time, you know, how I can care about animals and be involved in designing and building slaughterhouses. And sometimes I get very emotional. Yes, I ethically justify eating meat, but we've got to give animals a good life. We've got to give them a life worth living. For millennia, we've lived very close to the seasons. We've lived very close to animals. Very recently, very, very recently, it's changed completely. And so we're just trying to get to grips with this as a species. Like, how do we deal with this new power we have to design and manufacture and create? And how does that affect the world around us? So in another thousand years, we'll look back on this and say, yeah, that was the time when people had to figure out all this new technology. And it took them a while. But they got the ethics and the morality lined up eventually, and it all worked. 
I believe that it will work. Don't give up, I know you can see All the world and the mess that we're making Can't give up and hope God will intercede Come on back Imagine that we could get it together We stand up for where we need to be Cause crying won't save or feed a hungry child Can't lay down and wait for a miracle to change things So lift up your eyes, lift up your heart Singing, mercy will we overcome this Oh, one by one could we turn it around Maybe carry on just a little bit longer And I try to give you what you need Me and you and you and you We just wanna be free, yeah, yeah But you see, all the world is just as we've made it And until we got a new world I got to say that love is not a whisper or a weakness No, love is strong Got to get together, yeah Gotta get, gotta get, gotta get So there is no reason to fight Mercy, will we overcome this? Yeah, one by one, could we turn it around? 